All right, everybody. So this is a video on evidence in evolution. Um, whenever we take notes, you guys always have super great questions. Um, so feel free to ask them kind of as we go um, and just post them on the discussion board that's in Canvas and your teacher will answer whatever kind of questions you have. So what are trying, scientists trying to do um, when we're looking at evidence? Um, really, we are trying to compare structures and see what kind of similarities can we find between them. So we are really looking at those relationships and seeing what we can find. So the first thing is a homologous structure. And basically what that is, is when different, when organisms share the same structure. But they actually perform different functions. So what we're going to look at here, um, when you look at the human, the horse, the dolphin, and the bat, um, you can see this purple part um, that is all the same bone and all these different um, arms of different animals. And obviously, we don't use ours the same way that a horse or a dolphin does. Those are like your fingers. We obviously do not use them the same way a horse does or a dolphin uses um, its flippers or a bat would use its wings, um, but they are all the same structure. Um, so we can kind of compare these and see that maybe we did come from a similar thing. All right, so next is an analogous structure. Uh, and what that is, is when organisms perform the same function, but they have different structures. Here looking at this bat, um, a bat's bones, kind of like we saw in the upper picture, um, really fan out. The fly does not have any bones in it, and then a bird has bones at the top here. Um, so they all perform the function of flight, but they are all different. Um, they have different structures on the inside, but they do the same thing. Right. The last type of structure we're going to look at is a vestigial structure. Um, for me, I think this is one of the biggest thing that points to evolution. Um, vestigial structures are structures that have lost most or all of their functions, but are still present. So it's just something that really doesn't have a function anymore, um, but it, maybe at one time it did. So these are kind of the remnants of what all these creatures used to be in the past. Um, so looking at this first one on the left, this is a whale. Um, and you can see that it actually has a pelvis and a femur. Um, and whales obviously do not have any legs, so they have no use of a pelvis or a femur. But at one time, um, maybe they used to be um, part of like its, its previous ancestor. So I kind of drew these over here on this guy on the right. Yeah, that's obviously your pelvis and then your femur is that part of your leg. So whales don't need this anymore, um, but we can see that maybe at one time they did have legs and they were on land. Okay, um, down here on the bottom, we have a snake. We have these little fangs sticking out. Um, on the bottom, these are actually um, its hind legs. Um, and you can't tell looking on the outside of a snake, but when you do, uh, um, an x-ray or look at the bone structure, you can really see the inside um, where those hind legs still are. Okay, but what about people, right? So let's talk about different parts of people. Uh, the first one is an ear muscle. So some people have the ability to kind of wiggle their ears back and forth. Um, I do not have this ability, but many people do. Um, that is when, um, from our ancestors, who used to have need more, um, better hearing ability to kind of avoid those predators. So they can move their ears around. Uh, the next one is your tonsils. So we can remove tonsils and nothing happens to you. Um, you are completely fine. Um, they are just a first part of your immune system. And we think they used to play a greater role in that before. Other vessel structure people would be male nipples. So men, men do not need them. Um, 
but they do in fact have them. Another one is a tailbone. Um, we obviously do not have a tail, um, but that bone is still present. So maybe at one time, um, or some of our ancestors maybe potentially had a tail, or um, were starting to develop one, but we obviously did not. Uh, we also have body hair. So we do not need body hair at this point. We have clothes and blankets, and we, we don't really need it, um, but we still have it for that outward um, protection that maybe we needed in the past. Another one is your appendix. So people get appendixes removed all the time. Um, we're not really sure of its function. It doesn't really do anything for us. Uh, and then you also have wisdom teeth. I know a lot of you guys are getting those removed currently. So your wisdom teeth are actually a great evolutionary advantage. So when we used to live in more um, wild times, some of your teeth would fall out. So what would happen is your wisdom teeth are just extra teeth you would get that would grow in the back and shove all of your other teeth over to kind of fill in those gaps that you're missing so you could still have um, a fully working jaw. Okay, and last one is your inner eyelid, um, which is kind of weird. I'm going to pull up a different picture of what that looks like. So when I'm talking about the inner eyelid, I'm talking about this part of your eye right here. Um, that is actually a third eyelid. Pretty freaky. Um, but when we look at other animals like snakes or birds, um, that third eyelid actually moves across their eye um, and does what an eyelid does, which is just keeps the eyelid moist. Um, sorry, this picture is kind of gross. Um, it's the only good picture I could find of this. Um, but we obviously don't need that. We just have these top two eyelids. Um, we don't use that little part, um, but that is a vestigial structure for people. Um, so another thing that scientists look at are embryos, different creatures. We have a fish, a reptile, a bird, um, then a human. And we can always, we can see that we all start pretty much the same. Um, even people have a tail and gill slits when we are first in the womb, which is pretty weird. Um, so basically what we should write down over here is just that through early stages of the embryo that we are very similar. Um, we can also look over here at the further development on the right picture. Um, we have a fish, a pig, and a human. Um, these are the early stages, and then as you go down, you can see as we develop, um, human anatomy is actually very, very similar to pig anatomy, which is why we are going to dissect pigs eventually. Um, and now in more modern times, um, we have the genome sequence for people, so we can actually see their DNA and can kind of compare it to other animals. So what we're doing is we are just looking at these similarities um, in coding regions and non-coding regions um, and comparing our DNA. And we are comparing this DNA from different species and looking at similarities. So like I said, over here on the left, you can see where there's different gaps at. Um, we have the most similar gaps with chimpanzees rather than like orangutans don't have the same gap. Um, but we can see all these different spots. So these are non-coding regions um, in our DNA that make us similar versus the blue areas are coding. So when we look at us and chimpanzees, we are 99% the same as them, um, and that's why we believe that they are our closest ancestor. Another thing we look at is also the amino acid sequence. Um, we, when we look at those proteins in different animals, um, we can kind of see that we have the exact same proteins and the exact same amino acids as other things, um, which basically just means that we came from these same creatures, right? We have the same ancestor. Okay, what about now? What about in real time? How are we similar um, or how are we seeing this play out? Okay, so um, over here on the left, I have a picture of an elephant. Um, there is a rare genetic trait in elephant that causes them to not have tusk. So in Mozambique, there was a very long civil war and they were really killing lots of elephants for ivory. So what ended up happening is that um, elephants with this very rare genetic condition ended up surviving and passing on this trait. So remember, survivors always pass on traits. So now in, the, in their population, we are seeing elephants that do not have tusk. Very strange. 
Um, but what about people? Okay, so over here on the right, I just have a guy that is diving. Um, so in certain areas of the world, um, there are populations of people that live off free diving. So they have no equipment. They just dive down there and um, get fish for food. And so what we're seeing in these different populations of people is that their spleen can actually grow and contract a lot more than a regular person's spleen. And what that does is it allows them to have more oxygen in their blood. Um, they also have a different hormone called T4. And what that does is allows them to increase their metabolism and they can go longer without oxygen. So they can stay under there for a very, very long time. Um, these people hold all the world records for breath. Um, yeah, and it's just part of that. Another thing we see is people who live high up on mountaintops um, have similar features because there's just not enough, there's not as much oxygen on the top of mountains as there is um, down below. So another thing we're seeing now is um, really big in the, in the medical community, which is antibiotic resistance. And basically it is um, lots of bacteria cause different types of diseases and we have medicine to combat that. But some of our medicines are starting to not work as effectively because these bacteria are evolving and changing um, and they're just not doing their job correctly. So the bacteria are changing in order to survive our medicine. Um, so the last part of our notes today is on fossils and rock layers. Um, if you are in my class, which is Miss Carol's class, um, this page is actually in the middle of the notes we took um, the other day when we were in class. So that's on there. Um, so basically what's going to happen is that scientists look at all these different layers in the rocks, and that just tells our history of the planet. So like over time, these layers build up. So if we look at them, we can kind of see where our past was. So basically scientists look at different layers and we can date organisms by where we find them in those layers. So looking down here at the bottom here, um, you can see uh, this is a trilobite at the very, very bottom, this dark brown. Um, he's basically kind of like a centipede with a, a shell. And then we have our layer of seashells. We have our layer of fish and kind of ferns and plants and aquatic things. And then we have this layer of dinosaurs and then above that would be um, current mammals. So when we dig down, we can find these different creatures. And that's kind of how we know how old things are. It's just based on where they are in the rock layers. Um, but sometimes people um, will plant things and we're not sure if they're actually real or fake. And so what we do is called radioactive carbon dating. And what that is, like say we find this dinosaur and we're trying to buy it but we're not sure if it's a real dinosaur or a fake dinosaur. We will take a little tiny piece of that and we'll compare the carbon that is inside it. So there's two different types of carbon um, in uh, just the natural world. There's carbon 14 and carbon 12. And what happens is over time, carbon 14 will change into carbon 12. So if we have lots and lots of carbon-14 in something, that means that it's a newer species or it's something more new um, versus if there's lots of carbon-12, that means it's really old. So that means it's had a lot of changes. All right, we're almost done here. Um, so this is all about continental drift theory. Um, what, that, what that is is that rock layers in different areas uh, or in different continents actually match the rock layers in other continents. Um, so the scientists got the idea that we were actually all one giant continent at one time, um, and that's called Pangea, as you see in this first picture here. This is Pangea. Um, it's kind of like a super continent with all of us together. Um, the different pieces kind of fit together like a little puzzle. Um, so what happened is over time, um, it slowly started to break apart. Um, even right now, our continents are moving. Um, the tectonic plates of the Earth move about um, a centimeter every year, and they slowly push us apart and push us apart. Um, and now we have our um, continents of today. All right, last couple things here that scientists look at to determine um, evolution. Um, we look at landscapes through catastrophism. And what that is, is how volcanoes, floods, and earthquakes can form Earth. Um, just earth landscapes. Uh, second thing here is gradualism. That is when we have small changes over time.
this um, with things like the Grand Canyon. So a river slowly carved out the Grand Canyon over many, many years. Um, and that's why it has that really deep edges and we can see the ridges within it. Um, and last thing is uniform uniformitarianism, which basically just says that layers have the same elements um, in different layers of rocks. So let's say we had um, these different two different layers um, of rock from two different continents. We can look at all these different chemicals that we find in one layer, um, say it's like sulfur or something, and then in a different continent, we can see that same sulfur. And what that does is it tells scientists that those land pieces were similar to each other, um, as well as maybe there used to be some kind of event like a volcano, which would produce sulfur.